Hey guys, so welcome back to Indoor Re. So the summer's here, it's holiday time for many of us, so today I'm going to tell you about how to prepare a reef tank for vacation. We all spend so much time and effort maintaining our reef aquariums that the thought of going away on holiday or with work and leaving it um, in the care of somebody else or um, even without anybody there to look after it on a day to day basis can feel quite daunting. Look! No heads! <laughs> now, I have to do this from time to time and what I'd like to do today is share with you how I prepare my tank for this. Now. This is a method I've developed over the last few years. Um, I'm still developing it, so I always think of ways to improve it. I don't claim to be, you know, the authority on this topic, um, but this was something that I couldn't find a lot of information on, um, and there seem to be different ways of approaching this. So maybe by me sharing my approach with you, it might help you find um, the right approach for you. The steps I followed don't don't fundamentally change too much depending on how long I'm away but I guess I do do a few things um, differently a few small things and um, the kind of the care I take and the extreme how extremely I follow these steps depends on um, on how long I'm away for so number one the first thing I do is I don't make changes leading up to the time that I go away so what this means is I don't go and add new equipment. Sometimes this can be really difficult because you know maybe there's a, a sale on or something and you want to um, take advantage of that and, um, and and buy something in that holiday season before you go away. You know, there's times I do that, but what I do is I think right, okay, don't put this on the tank just before I go. So this means not fiddling with the lighting, the flow, um, what I'm feeding, any supplements like. In the weeks leading up to leaving the tank, I just try and keep things absolutely as stable as possible. And if there are changes, they're changes that um, are well understood. So, for example, if my alkalinity was falling a little bit faster, I might choose to just bump it up. But I'll generally underdo it. Um, I'm always just trying to make as few as few changes as absolutely possible um, before going away. So number two is perform regular maintenance the day before going away. So in fact, I can extend the saying the days running up to going away. So what I'll do, um, and I'm not talking about that maintenance that you're meant to do every six months and then you haven't done and you decide to um, suddenly do it before going away because you think a full strip down of the skimmer might be a good idea. I'm talking things like filter socks, uh, maybe water changes if they're part of your reg regular schedule, um, uh, maybe cleaning out the skimmer cup, things like this. So I'll try and do these like a day or two before um, so that if there are any problems as a result of me performing this maintenance, maybe that one in a hundred times where you might catch um, something else in the sump while you're working and you might cause a little problem, which normally you would spot and you would fix. Like when you're away, you're not going to be here to spot that. Number three is all about how I feed the critters in my tank while I'm away. So for this, I use an auto feeder. I've used a few different ones over the years, but the main thing is it's one that you um, are comfortable with. You know how to set it up. Uh, you know it's reliable and it dispenses the type of food that you want to feed your fish uh, while you're away. So ordinarily when I'm here and I'm feeding manually, I feed a huge variety of different um, uh, food to my fish so I'm feeding different frozen foods uh, various dry foods uh, pellets uh, different flakes different pastes um, they get a really broad diet when I'm away it's a lot more slimmed down so I've, I have used some um, some feeders where you can put different types of dry food in but um, typically now what I use on the what I'd say is a larger tank than the nano I used to have I use a, um, it's one of the Eheim auto feeders, which are really good for pellets. I think you can put flakes in them, but um, yeah, I stick with the pellets. And, um, you know, you don't want to be setting an auto feeder up uh, for the first time, literally just the day before you go away. This is something that I would suggest you, um, you know, set up and actually trial run for a decent length of time um, before you go away and while you're there to look 
keep an eye on it. And this just helps you build that trust up in that you've got the quantity of food being dispensed is correct, that the feeder is actually putting food in when you want it to, that it's not getting clogged up because it's um, getting wet, for example. And then once you've actually done this and you've done it a few times and you kind of know what's right for your tank, then actually you can turn the auto feeder on at shorter notice. But again, going back to um, you know rules one and two, I always try not to change my strategy too much at the last minute. And I also try and set the auto feeder up actually the day or so before I go away. And the fish kind of get that little bonus of a bit of frozen food and some uh, auto feeder food as well, just the, the day before I go. Number four is uh, make sure everything's labeled quite clearly. So if I'm going away for a short period of time, I'm not expecting anybody to come in and like kind of keep an eye on the tank, but there are people who um, can come in for me if, I um, believe there's a problem and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, so what I like to do is make sure that everything is kind of labeled up properly. Now, this isn't something I do like again, right before I go away. This is something I try and bake into um, my like ongoing setup and maintenance and configuration of the tank. So I try to make sure that everything is as organized as possible and everything's labeled. One, this stops me making kind of silly mistakes. Um, you know, if, I, if I've got dosing containers that aren't correctly labeled or plugs that are not labeled, I might turn off the wrong thing or fill up the wrong dosing container with the, with the wrong liquid. All of this helps me avoid making mistakes, but it's even more important if somebody else has to come in. Number five is making sure there is somebody that you trust who is available should something um, really bad go wrong while you're away. Um, now things can go bad that you may not know about, but um, in a moment I'll tell you how there are ways that you can be aware when something goes wrong. And having um, you know a family member or a buddy who um, you can trust to come in and just you know um, like eyes and ears on the ground just to kind of tell you what's actually happening and maybe follow a few instructions to try and put things right. Now, if you've got like a reefing friend who um, is, is available and you trust and can help you with this, then brilliant. You know, um, not everybody has this. So what I'd say is it doesn't have to be um, somebody who knows a lot about reef tanks. It just has to be somebody who you trust and um, can also follow instructions. So, you know, you don't want somebody, for example, who, it, you know, you say feed one cube of food and they uh, go and feed three because they feel like the clownfish are begging, right? Because we all know that happens. Number six is remote monitoring. Now there are so many products available for our reef tanks that allow us to monitor aquariums remotely. Now, I guess in an ideal world, we would all have as many of these um, as possible, but the reality is they're very expensive. Um, and you know, I don't have very many of these. Um, what I've done is I've tried to be able to monitor what I would consider the tank ending scenarios. Um, and anything else I have on top of that is kind of a bonus. The monitoring which I've identified as being most critical to my reef tank is power loss. So power loss can be absolutely tank ending. This, this can be horrific. Um, and you know, I think we can break um, power loss down into two types. So there's power loss to the whole neighborhood. Now, fortunately, um, where I live in the UK, um, power loss where the power goes out for days is not particularly common. Now it's not to say it can't happen. Um, you know, if it did, I'd then have to be thinking about the topics like generators, but um, the most common scenario if it were to happen is um, power loss um, for, you know, a few hours. And the thing is with this type of power loss where it's to the whole neighborhood or the whole town, I am quite, um, reassured to know that everybody in the whole town or neighborhood will be contacting the provider of electricity to tell them there's a problem and they will very quickly have people out there working on it. The type of power loss that really keeps me awake at night is um, power that only goes off to my house alone or power loss within a specific room in my house. So for example, if the RCD uh, trips on 
um, on my some of the circuits in my house which might have my tank on then this is a really bad situation for me because me and the people who live in my house are the only people who are going to respond to that so this is the um, this is the type of problem that if you're actually there in the house you know cool you you recognize it's tripped maybe you identify the faulty appliance you remove it turn it back on and all's good right but if you're not here that could turn into the power being off for many days on the tank and that is a really 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 bad scenario um so the way i do this is i um i have a power loss monitor in place now this could be absolutely anything um that can monitor power loss i think the closer you can have it to the um, circuits that are actually uh, supplying your reef tank, the better. The way I do this is I have a little Raspberry Pi that's running in my uh, reef cabinet and it's powered off the same power supplies as the, the other critical elements, uh, other critical pieces of equipment. And it's I'm using the same uh, monitoring tools that you would use for monitoring a, um, a server, for example. So every, you know, five, 10 minutes, uh, that little Raspberry Pi is reporting to say that, yes, I'm online. Yes, I'm online. And if that report doesn't come through for any reason, then these online services will notify me via whatever method I choose. So text, um, uh, push notifications. Yeah to emails to tell me that the power has been lost and it'll also tell me again when it comes back on and there's quite a you, depending on the service you use you can get quite a granular control on um, exactly when do you want the notifications and uptime monitoring things like this so for me that was a way of getting a, a really um, kind of cheap I mean the monitoring service is usually for one item you can get it free um, on a free um, platform level and then you just need like a minimal piece of hardware that will actually detect the power loss. Now this approach isn't perfect, um, you know it can go down um, if there's a fault on the little computer you're running for example but, but if the power goes off it will tell you um, and what I do as well if I'm going away for more extended periods of time I'll actually um, set my um, kind of trusted friend family member up with notifications to their mobile phone so that they get a notification if the power goes off in the house and then they can kind of, we, we can be in touch and decide um, what's needed. Okay, so the things I've talked about so far, I would do for whatever length of time I was gonna be away. So this could be a couple of days or maybe up to a week or just over. If I'm going away for longer than that, I might be looking to maybe ask that trusted friend just to call in, um, you know, once a week maybe, just to check up on how things are going now. I'm not asking them to do anything major. One of the tasks I have had um, family members do before is swap over the ATO container. So I typically, in fact, one of the things that led me to do my ATO with barrels of water was it's really easy for family members to swap over. So. What I'll say to them is, you know, somewhere anywhere between a week and a week and a half between these two days, if you could call in and kind of just lift the pump out of one barrel and stick it in the next one, which I've already lined up next to it, then this is like super easy. Um, you know, they don't have to be a, a reefing buddy to do this. Occasionally, uh, maybe I'll ask them to swap the filter socks again. If I'm asking somebody to do this, I'm not going to ask them to kind of clean them out and everything like this. I, I kind of show them beforehand how to do it and I just ask them to take them out and put them in a barrel and stick the lid on. But um, usually again, things like filter socks, I'm, I'm not going to worry. Um, originally, I think I was asking people to do a lot more than they probably needed to do and this just creates additional risk. So. And also you, you're putting people out more, you know, I'd say really the tank will run quite well on its own if you are not tinkering and as long as nothing really unusual happens. Now, again, something unusual is more likely to happen if you've got somebody who's not used to doing things uh, working on it. Um, you know, for me, that buddy is really there for um, power loss. Definitely power loss. Watch out for this one. Right guys, so I think that's probably enough info for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and I hope you found it useful. 
If you have, please, if you could give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. Um, doesn't cost you anything to do it and it really helps me out with the channel um, by subscribing. It'll also make sure you're notified of any new videos I release so that you can follow along um, with the tank. So until next time on Indoor Reef, keep it stable, keep it fun and keep reefing.